Kincaid, West Virginia, January 22, 1992. At approximately 2 a.m. on this bitterly cold morning, 72-year-old Eddie Brown set out on his usual early morning walk to his place of employment, the Sunoco service station, roughly a mile and a half away. It was a trek that Eddie had made literally hundreds of times. Tragically, this would prove to be Eddie's last commute. Approximately 40 minutes later, a passing motorist observed Eddie unlocking the door to the service station. A short time later, two acquaintances stopped at the station and found a dazed and confused Eddie Brown inside. He had sustained a massive head injury. Twenty-nine days later, on February 20th, Eddie Brown succumbed to his injuries. Today, his killer or killers remain unidentified. The brutal murder of Eddie Brown was a shock to the community. Despite the seemingly opportunistic nature of the killing, authorities soon determined that Brown's murder was, in all likelihood, no random act of violence. It was well known by those in the community that Eddie was kind and generous and always carried a large amount of cash on his person. This, combined with Eddie's regular morning routine, quickly led authorities to conclude that he had been targeted by a person or persons unknown. 27 years later, many of the questions surrounding Eddie's death remain unanswered. And while the why and the where can be surmised with reasonable certainty, law enforcement, as well as Eddie's friends and family, are still seeking that one final point to this frustrating triangle. Who? Dewey Edward Brown was a lifelong resident of Kincaid, West Virginia, a small rural community located approximately 35 miles southeast of Charleston. In 1978, after spending most of his life working for the railroad, Eddie changed gears and took a job at a small service station along West Virginia Route 61. Eddie quickly gained a local reputation as a gentle giant. Although nearly six feet tall and weighing around 220 pounds, Eddie was known by most to have a heart that matched or exceeded his physique. Local children knew that Eddie could often be counted on to slip them a free chocolate bar or other sweets while they waited for their school bus at the station. Adults knew that if they were strapped for cash, Eddie was always more than willing to help out. Although once commonplace in communities like Kincaid, such altruism was fast becoming a scarce commodity in the early 1990s. An economic downturn had taken its toll on much of West Virginia. Former coal communities and small towns were especially hard hit. Populations dropped as fast as property values. In many instances, this proved an open invitation for an unsavory and most unwelcome element to move in. In the weeks and months leading up to Eddie's murder, crime had risen sharply in the Page-Kincaid area. A series of burglaries, increased drug activity, and acts of vandalism had prompted local law enforcement to increase their patrols through the twin communities. Around the same time, a group of rowdy juveniles had taken up residence in the neighborhood near Eddie's home. Much of the lawlessness and other unrest in the area was attributed to this group. Shortly before the assault on Eddie Brown, the supposed leader of this group was arrested, and things seemed, at least, to settle down. In January of 1992, Eddie lived with his youngest sister, Ola, in the Brown family home at the end of Camp Branch Road, approximately one and a half miles from the Sunoco station where he worked. Eddie did not own a car and would routinely walk the distance to the station each morning, 
partly along West Virginia Route 61 and partly by way of the adjacent railroad tracks. Although the Sunoco station where he worked did not open until 6 a.m., Eddie made it a point to routinely open by 4 a.m., well ahead of most other stores in the area. Typically, Eddie would leave his home around 2 a.m. each morning, occasionally catching a ride with Richard and Clarine Marshall, who delivered newspapers in the area. The morning of January 22, 1992, started just like any other. Eddie's sister Ola prepared breakfast for him, and he later donned a sweatshirt and jacket, each with a hood as well as a baseball cap. Eddie left his residence at approximately 2 a.m., his sister Ola later stated that she thought she heard lowered voices not long after Eddie departed. Neighbors later recalled that about this time, several dogs in the neighborhood began barking. Few, however, paid the barking any mind, and Ola soon went back to bed. Eddie Brown lived here, at 185 Camp Branch Road, near a small collection of residences situated along a side track of the Norfolk Southern Railway, which runs adjacent to West Virginia Route 61. Another cluster of homes is located on the other side of this roadway. The Sunoco station, where Eddie worked, was located here, approximately one and a half miles to the north. The surrounding region is rural, but not desolate. Many homes dot the roadway between Eddie's residence and the service station, and vehicular traffic, although light at that hour of the morning, is not uncommon. Approximately 40 minutes after leaving his home, a passing motorist who knew Eddie and his routine drove by the Sunoco station on his way home. He observed Eddie at the front door, apparently in the process of unlocking it. Eddie looked up and made eye contact with the motorist. He was obviously awake and mobile, but he appeared distant and surprised. The motorist drove on, thinking that the sudden appearance of his car headlights may simply have startled Eddie. At approximately 4 a.m., Richard and Clarine Marshall drove by the Sunoco station after completing their morning paper route. They were puzzled to see the front door ajar, but no lights on inside. The marshals pulled into the service station's parking area. When they got out of their car, they heard the store's burglar alarm blaring away inside. Fearing a robbery and that Eddie may be in trouble, the marshals entered the establishment and turned on the lights. Eddie Brown was meandering about the small store in a confused and dazed fashion. The marshals spoke to Eddie, asking if he was okay. Eddie reportedly stated that he had fallen on the railroad tracks en route to work and hit his head. Richard Marshall noted blood on Eddie's face and that he was holding what appeared to be a cleaning rag against the back of his head. Oddly, Eddie seemed oblivious to the burglar alarm, which continued to buzz as he walked around the store's interior. The marshals reported that Eddie looked stunned, and the closer they got, the more apparent it became that he had sustained a serious wound to his head. Nearby, Richard Marshall observed Eddie's ball cap laying on the store counter and noted that it too was damp with blood. Marshall insisted that Eddie come with he and his wife and they would take him to the hospital. The marshals recall that Eddie remained conscious throughout the drive from Kincaid to the Plateau Medical Center in Oak Hill, about 20 minutes away. He conversed with the marshals, but never elaborated on what or who had caused his injuries. At the hospital, it did not take long for attendees to conclude that Eddie had not tripped or fallen, but had been savagely beaten up. The hospital quickly got in touch with Eddie's brothers, Glenn and Howard, as well as the Fayette County Sheriff's Department. Sheriff's deputies responded to the Sunoco station shortly after getting the call. At first, it appeared like an all-too-common occurrence, a hold-up or robbery followed by a vicious attack. Yet, aside from the blood and the burglar alarm, nothing at the service station appeared to be out of place. No indications of a struggle were found inside or outside. While Eddie Brown clung to life, authorities started backtracking his movements. 
Eddie was known to carry two flashlights with him each morning when he walked to work. One of them was found at the service station. Later that morning, two of Eddie's neighbors contacted the sheriff's department and advised that they had found Eddie's other flashlight lying on the ground about 75 feet away from his home. The flashlight's lens was cracked as if it had been dropped, and it was lying along what would have been Eddie's normal walking route. Throughout the day, other disquieting clues gradually came to light. An X-ray of the back of Eddie's head revealed the true extent of his injuries. He had been struck from behind, not once, but four times with a blunt and pointed object. When he viewed the X-ray, Eddie's brother Howard commented that the back of his skull looked like a road map. A close examination of Eddie's clothing yielded more information. Eddie was known to carry $500 and a medical card in the right breast pocket of his work shirt. The $500 and medical card were missing, but $176 belonging to Via's Sunoco station, as well as a tire gauge, pen, and paper, were found untouched in the other pocket. The front of Eddie's trousers were scuffed and embedded with gravel as though he had fallen to his knees. Further substantiating this theory, Eddie's knees were later found to be badly bruised. Perhaps the most curious clue of all was not made public until 2007. When Richard and Clarine Marshall first came upon Eddie at the service station, he was holding what appeared to be a brown rag against the back of his head. The garment turned out to be a small, patterned silk blouse whose presence at the station has never been explained. According to store owner Robert Via, the blouse had not been present at the station when it had closed the previous evening. Authorities concluded that Eddie had most likely been assaulted from behind not long after leaving his home. They feel that Eddie was likely first struck in the head, which caused him to fall to his knees upon a gravel surface. At the time, there was no gravel in the vicinity of the service station. His assailant or assailants, likely familiar with Eddie's habits, searched his right breast pocket and removed the $500 as well as the medical card. However, this scenario makes the question of time a crucial factor in what transpired that morning. Authorities estimate that Eddie was assaulted at or just after 2 a.m., the time he normally left his home. They feel the assault took place near the location where his flashlight was found, about 75 feet away from his residence. Yet, the motorist who later observed Eddie unlocking the door to the service station was quite certain that the time was right at 2.39 a.m., just over 30 minutes after the authorities feel Eddie was attacked. If both times are correct, or even close, how is it that Eddie, who sustained a massive head injury as a result of the attack, managed to traverse the distance from his home along Camp Branch Road to Via's service station, a distance of one mile and a half, in so short a time? Could Eddie have been assaulted at some other location along his normal route? If so, why was his flashlight found damaged on the ground near his home? Is it possible that Eddie was transported to the Sunoco station, perhaps even by the person or persons who had assaulted him? Although 72 years of age, Eddie was, by all accounts, in good physical condition, and at nearly 6 feet tall and 250 pounds, most feel he could have held his own if assaulted by a single person. Could Eddie have been overtaken by several individuals? Authorities have hypothesized that if this was the case, it could explain the presence of the silk blouse. They feel it is possible that those who attacked Eddie may have been accompanied, willingly or unwillingly, by an unidentified female who may have offered her blouse to Eddie in some desperate form of pity. Rumors about what happened to Eddie Brown spread quickly through the small, tight-knit community. Some conjectured that a well-known convicted felon with a history of assault and robbery was to blame. Others claimed that the killer was someone whom Eddie had once helped financially, but later refused continued support. 
Eddie's family later quipped that there were almost as many rumors about what happened to him as there were residents of Kincaid. However, at each turn, informants or potential witnesses seemed to shrink away, either out of fear of retribution or a desire to remain out of the spotlight. Although he survived the initial attack and his condition was originally reported as stable, Eddie Brown was never able to recall what transpired on the morning of January 22nd. Eddie's condition, however, did not improve. Dewey Edward Brown died in Beckley, West Virginia on Thursday, February 20th, 1992, and was buried in the Kincaid Cemetery. His sister Ola passed away in 2015, his brother Howard in 2017, and his brother Glenn on July 15, 2018. The home where Eddie was living at the time he was killed has since burned down. After sitting abandoned and derelict for many years, the building which housed the Sunoco service station where Eddie Brown once worked was purchased in 2018 by Kincaid resident Justin Hatfield. Now known as The Station, the store where Eddie once greeted his customers is again serving the Page Kincaid area. Today, cars roar by on Route 61. Trains lumber past along the Norfolk Southern Railway. And every year, the residents of Page Kincaid host the annual 61ers reunion. In 2019, the reunion was dedicated to the memory of Eddie Brown. Authorities feel certain that the key to solving this murder lay in resolving just what took place between 2 and 2.39 a.m. on the morning Eddie was attacked. Somehow, during this short time frame, Eddie Brown left his home, was attacked and robbed, and showed up at Via's service station in time to be witnessed by a passing motorist. Authorities would be very interested in speaking with anyone who may have seen or heard anything during this time period between Brown's home and the former Sunoco station, or for that matter, with anyone who feels they may be able to shed some light on the murder of Eddie Brown. There is currently a $22,000 reward being offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction in this case. Authorities feel reasonably certain that Eddie Brown was attacked approximately 75 feet away from his home along Camp Branch Road at approximately 2 a.m. on January 22, 1992. They feel Brown was likely struck from behind by a blunt object and then robbed of $500 and a medical card from his right breast pocket. Approximately 39 minutes later, Eddie was observed unlocking the door to what was then Via's Sunoco Station along West Virginia Route 61, approximately one and a half miles away. Brown normally walked this distance each morning. However, authorities are not certain if Brown would have been able to traverse the mile and a half of roadway and railway following the injuries he sustained. They feel it is possible that Brown may have been assaulted by one or more individuals, at least one of which may have been a female. Brown was discovered dazed and injured inside the service station at approximately 4 a.m. He was bleeding from his head and was pressing a small patterned silk blouse against the back of his head. Brown succumbed to his injuries on February 20, 1992. Authorities have never publicly named either a suspect or a person of interest in the murder of Eddie Brown. If you have any information concerning the murder of Eddie Brown, please contact the Fayette County Sheriff's Department at 304-574-4126 or Crime Stoppers of West Virginia at 304-255-7876. Thank you.